Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about the Poisson distribution and we're going to mainly focus on how do we know the study we're doing is a Poisson distribution and how can we utilize Excel to make our calculations easier. What I would do is pause the video and take a picture of this screen. What you'll see on this screen are the three discrete distributions we really focus on, binomial, Poisson, and hypergeometric. There is a previous video, you could watch a binomial, and today we're going to focus on the Poisson distribution, the assumptions of the Poisson distribution, and how to work with Poisson.dist in Excel. All right, let's get right to it. We click on the Poisson tab, and what we have here is the following ex example. We're going to study phone calls arriving at an emergency response desk, and they seem to arrive at a rate of 20 per hour. So first of all, is this a Poisson distribution if we want to track the number of phone calls per hour? To do this, um, the part A, we have to go through our four ingredients to what makes a Poisson distribution. Again, let's go back to them. First, we want to count the number of successes in a given area. So here's how I like to start. What's a success here? And in this case, a success is what? A phone call. What's the area? The area here is an hour. See, an hour is how long are you going to, sorry, not an hour, but the area is how long you're going to count for. In this case, we're going to count for one hour. It could be for one day. It could be for any units. For example, we could count potholes in a mile or scratches in a feet of aluminum foil because we're looking for scratches and dents and issues when we come in manufacturing. Or we can look at certain type of people um, with a certain characteristic per day, all right? If we're a hospital or we are a high school, we're tracking people with learning disorders, we can track the number of students per day with that type of disorder, that learning disorder, and look for more support or less support depending on that number. All right. So success is what you're trying to count. The area is how long you're going to count. So let's look at number one again. Uh, yes, in the legend. So number one again is you're going to count number of successes in a given area. So in this case, um, number one was we want to count phone calls in an hour. The answer is yes, we want to do that. So that's definitely number one. Number two. The probability, and here's what I like to do, by the way. I like to replace what the event is, phone call, given area, hour. So that way I can read this sentence with those replace and see if that sentence makes sense. So here it is. The probability of a phone call in a given hour is the same for all hours. So I just replace the event and areas in my sentence. So once again, the probability of a phone call call in an hour is the same in any hour. So what I do is I first write down the statement and then I ask myself, is it true? Would this statement be true? The probability of a phone call in an hour is the same in any hour. Well, I'd have to know the data. I have to understand the response desk. Are there peak times? Are there not peak times? Are there times where typically 20 per hour is the same? Now, if it is always 20 per hour, then I'm okay with number two. If there are non-peak times, the way I get around the issue with number two is simply state we are going to look at all the peak times, all the times in which 20 per hour is typical. The non-peak times, maybe we use, utilize a second Poisson for that time period. But for this time, I'm going to assume in this question, every single hour has the same probability of getting 20 phone calls. All right, number three, what's next? So again, number of phone calls in a given hour is independent of any other hour. So number three, the number of phone calls per hour is the is independent of any hour. And for the most part, this makes sense. Um, just because there was eight phone calls in the first hour, 
How do we know how many phone calls are going to be in the next hour? They should be independent, unless there's some major catastrophe changing the whole probability distribution. All right. But I would think if it's a typical emergency response desk, um, I don't. If I get 20 phone calls in the first hour, doesn't tell me more or less what's going to happen in the second hour, so on, so forth. So number three makes sense. Again, if it doesn't, you might be able to limit the hours to make it sense from peak hours to non-peak hours. That might work. Last but not least, number four, probability. The probability of two or more phone calls goes to zero if the time period shrinks, shrinks to zero. And what I mean by that is we're at an hour. Shrink it to a minute. Shrink it to a second. And keep shrinking it. As you keep shrinking the time period, the probability of two or more phone calls should really shrink with it. And that makes sense in this case. You have less time means less time for phone calls. So I'm okay with that. So again, I'm okay with one, two, three, and four. So I'm okay with this being a Poisson distribution for part A. Normally, the hardest part of any work is determining the distribution. Once you determine the distribution, we have a lot of tricks in Excel to make the rest of the questions pretty easy. All right. So if you've watched my previous video on binomial, you should know how I'm going to attack this question. That is, what is the probability exactly 23 phone calls occur? Well, first of all, we know it's Poisson. So I'm going to run the Poisson.dist. And of course, you can't run it without the equals. That's a pretty basic thing we got to know. Poisson.dist. So we enter it in. And of course, usually that works. So I'll just spell it out. Dot dist. Open the parentheses and look at what it wants. It wants X. Well, typically X is the number of successes you want. In this case, we want 23 phone calls. The mean is the typical number you would see in the time period. In this case, 20. And as per previous video, we know the last number is zero. Recall, the last number is zero because we're looking at exactly 23 phone calls. So the zero represents, we're just doing the probability mass. We're not going to do a cumulative total. We're just going to look at one exact answer, 23. And so there's my probability. There's a 6% chance we'll see exact, or whatever that number is, 6.68% chance that exactly 23 phone calls will occur that hour. Now, you might be saying, is there another way to get it? Of course. You could look at the original function on our formula sheet. Sorry about the click. So our in the probability mass function for Poisson, here is the formula. In grad school statistics, you could learn about this formula. For us, we're going to utilize it. Please notice the formula. It's e to the negative lambda times lambda to the x over x factorial. Well, if you know what lambda and x are, it's just a calculator question. Well, lambda, by definition, is the average in a Poisson distribution. Okay, So lambda is the average. X is the success you're looking for. So utilizing this, e to the negative lambda, lambda to the x over x factorial, allow me to utilize Excel to get the same answer. So again, I have a numerator. It is the exponential function raised to the negative, the mean, 20, times lambda, what's lambda here, 20, raised to the power of 23. I would do this all together, for if not, you might get a calculator overflow, an Excel overflow, all divided by x factorial. I believe we have the factorial button called fact. Factorial, or fact, will take the factorial of any number you put in. And since we want x factorial, we'll write in 23. Boom. Notice they match. And they should. All binomial Poisson disk does. I apologize, all Poisson.dist does is exactly this formula. This formula is preloaded into this. So all we did was we took the probability mass function of the Poisson and loaded it into Excel so we could just quickly do it. Because all we need is two numbers. Look at this formula. There are only two numbers you need. You need to know lambda and you need to know x, the number of successes. From there, we can calculate out the probability of the event. Either way, by formula 
or by Excel. Excellent. Part C. Let's do it again. Exactly 41 phone calls during this period. Well, again, pause on, dot dis, then we open it up. And how many successes? 41. How many on average were we supposed to get? 20. Cumulative? No. Just stop at 41 and give me 41 exactly. Boom. And there's our answer. I like to do one of these in every video to really remind you guys, when you get small numbers like this, you should understand what this number represents. This is a very small number. It represents point one, two, three, four zeros. Then the rest of the number starts. One, three, five, four, nine, one above. Notice they match exactly. So point zero, 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 one, three, five, four, nine, one. Because E negative five just means slide the decimal left five places. What it means to me means the odds are pretty much impossible. What is the chances we're going to see exactly 41 phone calls this hour? Shouldn't happen. Should not happen. What does that mean if it does? It means something happened. Maybe COVID happened, all right? Something really seriously happened. A school shooting, some type of emergency. I mean, this is an emergency response desk. What is it? Is it in a hospital? Was there a major car accident that involved a lot of passengers, a bus turnover, all right? I'm thinking about all the things where emergency response desk would be overwhelmed with phone calls. And the odds of that, given the trend is 20 per hour, the odds of 41 phone calls is almost zero. So if it does happen, something really unusual happened. And that's where we turn from just looking at numbers to understanding what the numbers represent. Because we have Excel, we can get to the answer of what should have happened and if something did happen and compare the two and go, wow, that's unusual. All right, now what about a less than or more than? Well, if I'm gonna do a less than or more than, I go back to the basics, I think logic. So I think logic and I think less than 25. Less than 25 would be 24, 23, dot, 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 down to zero. That would be the set. I always start with sets because I like to get my head wrapped around how I'm counting in the set when it's less than 25. So once I know that, I can do the Poisson dot dist, and I can say, all right, let's think about this. If I don't do Poisson dot dist, and I just use the formula, I'd have to do the formula for each and every X. See, each one of these numbers in this set is an X. And you'd have to do this for each and every one of the numbers in the set if you're going to use the original formula. The great thing about Excel and the cumulative function is you can say, hey, start at the highest number in the set. Again, the average is 20 to fill out the formula and put a one here, put the true on. What that does is it turns on the counter. It says, hey, start at 24 and count down all the way to zero. Do each of them individually and then add them together because that's what I want. And that's our answer. It is a pretty high probability we're going to see less than 25 phone calls in the hour. And that's important to me. Excellent. Part E. All right. What is the probability? More than 40 phone calls. Once again, I'm going to build my set. More than 40, right? More than 40. So the highest number. Now, let's be careful here. The highest number in this set. Notice, I don't know the answer to that. It's actually infinity, and then infinity minus one, blah, 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 all the way down to 41. Notice I don't have an upper bound in this set, because it could be an infinite number of phone calls could come in. Now, I know realistically that's not, impossible. that's not possible, but I have to, you know, put in the fact that I don't know of the upper bound. This is the one of the keyest difference, biggest difference between the Poisson and the binomial. In the binomial, you have an upper bound. In a Poisson, you might have an upper bound, but there's none stated. All right, so how does one deal with a more than 40 phone calls? Well, you deal with it the same way as you did in any distribution. When you have a more than, you do a one minus. The reason being is, again, how the heck do I type in an infinity? You can't. So here's what I do. One represents all numbers. If I added up every single option, that'd be 100%, because that's what it means. Let me take off ones I don't want. That's what the minus represents. If I take off the ones I don't want, then guess what you get? The ones you do want. 
So what are the ones you don't want? Now, that's where the set is important. I do want from 41 to infinity, which means I don't want from 40 down to zero. And so that'd be 40, 20 is the average again. Turn on that cumulative to count it all the way down to zero for me. And there's my answer. Now, is that a good answer? Is that a typical answer? It could be, especially with the fact if we're too far away from what would be average, all right? We're looking at the set of numbers 41 to infinity. Each one of these numbers could have a small probability. And in this case, it does, because each one of these numbers, when you add it up, adds up to a total of, again, a very small number. So the odds that I see more than 40 phone calls is just a very small number. It would be a highly unusual for me to see that. All right, let's continue on. Because in order for me to really understand part E, part F, and part G will help me out. All right. So expected, usually you build a table and then do X times the probability and add it up. But because it's Poisson, we have the average and the standard deviation for free. You just got to memorize them or have a formula sheet. This is just my formula sheet I keep with my distributions on it. I know Poisson. I look underneath. My average is lambda. My standard deviation is the square root of ant lambda. That is so sweet. So my average is 20. Well, isn't that what I just said in the question? The rate is typically 20 per hour. That would be the average. By the way, the standard deviation, not too bad, is the square root of 20. In that case, that would be the number per hour difference for phone calls. 4.47 phone calls per hour difference. So from one hour to another hour, that would be the typical difference I would see, about 4.47 phone calls. So again, a typical call center here would expect 20 calls per hour with a plus or minus of about 4.47 phone calls per hour. The standard deviation is a great way of understanding what the plus or minus is. Again, I typically think 20 phone calls, give or take, Let's say that's roughly five, five. So that means a lower bound of 15 and an upper bound of 25, when I put these together, would be a typical range of phone calls in an hour. Why do I care? Staffing purposes. How many people do I need at the desk? How many firemen? How many principals? How many superintendents? How many nurses? Um, what is this emergency response desk for? And I can determine how many people I need and what degrees I need. So last but not least, it does give me a great thing I like to always think about. So what's unusual? What would be an unusual number of phone calls? Well, the answer I always think about is going back to the basics of outliers. You always start with the mean. And then if you add on twice the standard deviation, that will be a quote unquote typical outlier. Anything past this, anything above this would be an outlier. Again, why do I say this? And let me bring this down so you can see the screen. This makes sense to me because of a normal distribution. Now, this is not a normal distribution. So this is close, but it's not perfect. But it gives me an eyeball idea. I always use the two standard deviation as an eyeball idea. I start with the center, and then I go two standard deviations above or below, of course. We can ask, what is a really slow day? You know, how bad is a really slow day? Well, if you double this, that's about 10. Take away 20 minus 10, that's 10. So phone calls from 0 to 10. If I get two phone calls or three phone calls in that hour, something's unusual. Something really weird is going on that my response desk is not getting the numbers. Maybe the phone is flipped uh, on the fritz. Good question. This is the high end. You know, I'm thinking about the high end. But understand, there also is a low end for unusual. All right, we're looking at the high end. So, in fact, let me do a bonus question. What is the probability of more than 29 phone calls, okay? So what is that probability? I think it's pretty low if my outlier idea holds up. So, again, from part H, we notice any time we're above a 28.9, so 29 and above, that should be a very unusual hour for phone calls. So let's think about this instead. Let's look at one, which is everything, minus the non-unusual, the 28, 20, and 1. And let's see what is the odds we're going to see more than 20 or 
more than 28. So that would be 29 or more phone calls is what I'm calculating out right now. All right. This is the formula for more 29 or more phone calls in an hour. My hypothesis, because of this outlier revelation right here, the two standard deviations, I expect this to be pretty small. Boom shakalaka, 3.4%. That is pretty small. So it does fit into the idea, what are the odds we're going to be above this bound? 3%. That's a pretty unlikely number. So this does fit into the realm. Once you know average and you know the typical spread, you can determine what's unusual by doubling the spread. That's really what I do in this formula one more time. I double the spread and add it to the average. If you go twice the spread from the average, that's unusually high or if you subtract, unusually low for that phone system, for that emergency response system. How do I know that? Well, look what I did here. I found the odds that we're gonna see more, 29 or more, gotta use my correct words, 29 or more phone calls in an hour. And it's only 3.4%. I would call that a low risk. Excellent. All right, guys, now's the time to pause the video and please try example two without me. I'll be right back to see how you did. All right, guys, we're back. So example two is a nice HR question, all right? dealing with age discrimination. So in 2008, we can look it up, and there was 24,584 age discrimination claims filed. Let's assume, typically, there's 260 work days in a year. That's just a nice number to work with. So first off the bat, what is the average number of claims per day? That just sets up what's our lambda. That's really what that is. What is our lambda? So let me put that over here, part A. What is our lambda? Well, it would be 24,584 divided by 260. Because I want to know typically how many claims are there in a day. That's what I'm really looking at is the unit here, which would be claims per day. I need to have that number. So in total, there's 24,584 claims. Divide by the number of days we're assuming in a year, and that would be the typical number of claims per day. All right, that's important to me. We're looking at claims per day. Now that I know that, I'm just gonna follow this recipe right here for the rest of the questions. Part B, what's my success? A success would be a claim is filed. Now, yes, I know that's not a good thing, okay? We all know an age discrimination, age discrimination lawsuit is not cool. But what we're doing here is understanding a success could be a bad thing, okay? In this case, a success means, hey, a claim is filed. Yay! All right. So, and what is our area? Our area here is the day, a work day. Got it. So, let's go through all the steps. What are we doing? Well, we're counting claims in a day. Perfect. Number two, the probability of a claim in a day is the same in all days. I gotta believe age discrimination does not increase or decrease depending on the day. Now, I'm not an expert in this. So if an expert came in and said, no, 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 age discrimination spikes in the winter, I don't know. <laughs> I would not know, all right? That doesn't make any sense to me, but I'm not an expert. But if somebody said, no, 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 the month of February you cannot utilize because there's a spike, then I'll say fine. Then I will change my question to, I'm gonna study all of the months but February where there's a spike. And then we'll look at February by itself. All right, now, because I really want the Poisson distribution so I can answer questions about what's typical, what's not typical for a work day when it comes for claims and age discrimination. All right, so what about the next statement? The number of claims per day is independent of any day. And really what that simply means is, let's say we had, uh, it's 94.6 is the average. So let's say we had 102 claims on Monday. What's that tell me about Tuesday? I don't know, nothing. <laughs> and that's important. If something on Monday told me about Tuesday, then we're not independent and that'll violate the probability. And that means we don't have a Poisson distribution. We'll have something else to work with. We'll look up another distribution. We need all four sentences to make sense. 
That's really what it is, is I like to write down all the sentences, and then I like to see if they make sense. If they make sense to me, then I continue on with the questions. So the probability of two more claims goes to zero if the time period shrinks to zero. And that makes sense. How can you file, you know, what are the odds of filing two or more claims if instead of a day, I look at an hour, then I look at a minute, then I look at a second. The odds of two more claims coming in because I'm shrinking that time frame is obviously going to go to zero. So one through four in my mind stack up nicely. So I do have a Poisson distribution. That is the whole key again, understanding it is a Poisson scenario. You really get, once you get number one, you're pretty safe. If you know you're counting something per an event, an event per an area, you're pretty safe. But you, you should always acknowledge these. And if something is sticking out and not working, then you might want to try a different distribution. All right, let's continue on. Time to get into the questions. Uh, part C. Well, what is the probability more than 100 claims are filed? So again, I like to write down my set. More than 100, right? So that's infinity down to 101. Because we want more than 100. And if I'm doing a more than, I'm going to do a 1 minus because that's the set theory talk. The 1 represents, again, everybody is invited. But that's not good. That's where the minus comes in. The minus says, no, no, no. I don't want everybody. See, when you put the 1, you're going from affinity to 0 in the set. When you put number 1 down right there, you're going from affinity down to 0. That's not what I want. So I'm going to take away the numbers I don't want. When you do a minus, you're taking away the numbers you don't want. So the numbers I don't want are 100 and down. So 100, first of all, what's the new mean? Let's not make a mistake this time. 84.6. And yes, turn on the counter. Again, that counter will make this click down from 100 down to 0. The numbers you don't want. And that's what the minus represents. And there's our odds. Not bad. 26% chance we're going to have more than 100 claims filed on any given day. Or if you're looking at it, that's not really good. we got to do something to change the world's view on age discrimination. D, what is the probability fewer than 88 claims? All right, so fewer than 88. So that means 87 dot, 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 down to zero. Well, if we're counting down to zero, oh, this is an easy one. This is a nice one. This is what Poisson.dis is built for in Excel. Just tell me where you want to start. Again, tell me the typical mean, 94.6. And tell me, do you want to count down? The one just says, hey, let me count down for you. The set tells me I want to count down to zero because these are the successes I want to add up. Again, the idea is each one of these, I'm going to find the probability of each one of these. What's the probability of 87 files? What's the probability of 86 claims? What's the probability of 85 claims? I'm going to do them separately and then add them together. But that's what Excel does. Excel adds quickly. So the Poisson disk is just when I turn on the one to me, it turns on a counter and it'll count down from 87 down to zero. It'll plug in the numbers 87 down to zero into the formula for Poisson. And we get our answer, roughly 23% chance. All right, so you know, 26% chance you're gonna see more than 100. 23% chance you're gonna see less than 88. You kind of get an idea of what spectrum of answers or claims you should come across your desk if you're in HR. All right, part E, what is the standard deviation? Well, the good news is, again, go back to the formula sheet. In a Poisson distribution, the standard deviation is the square root of average. So it's the square root of 94.6. And that would be the difference per day. So I expect roughly a 9.72 difference per day when it comes to filings of claims, all right? So roughly 10, 10 claims per day. So we know there's roughly 94 claims in a day with a plus or minus of 10 claims per day. That's what I look at here. Again, typically there's a plus or minus 10 per day claims. Awesome. There is a part F, let me put that in, between. Well, we haven't done a between in a while. How does one do a between? Well, the way you do a between, first, you set up your set, 
And at any time, you should pause and try this before I give you the answer. That's really what this is all about. Try it. So it's important to said inclusive. So that means I know I started 100 and count down to 80. So how do I get the numbers from 1 to 100 to 80 to come out? Here's what you do. When it's a between, you just got to run two of the distributions. First, you have a distribution that counts down to zero from the highest number. So that means from 100, 94.6 is the average, and count it down. When you put that in there, Poson.dist starts counting at 100 and doesn't stop counting. Minus. Now, we take out the ones we overcounted. Because when you turn on the counter, it does not stop. So we got to take off the numbers we did not want. So we start at 100 and start counting down. It's going to get to 80, and that's awesome. But the problem is that first pause on disk keeps going. That means it includes 79 and the rest of the ones I don't want. And that's why I'm throwing them out. And so this is my answer. Again, this first pause on starts at the top number here, the 100, and counts down to zero. That's too much. I only wanted to down to 80. So that's why I take off minus, take off, remove the probabilities from 79 down to zero. Because if you have 100 to zero minus 79 to zero, what's left is 180. This number is really cool to me because this is going to be important when we look at the normal distribution. I did this on purpose. 94.6 plus or minus this standard deviation is what we call the one standard deviation away from average. So if you add 972 to this, and take away 972 from this, you're getting one standard deviation away from the mean. The typical number is a roughly 68% of us are within one standard deviation of the mean. That's just a typical number everybody kind of knows. Roughly 68%, and that's what this number is, roughly 68% is one standard deviation from the mean. What does that mean practically? Almost all of us are within one unit of the mean. I don't care if it's height, weight, IQ, almost all of us are one standard deviation from the mean. So if you could tell me the mean and the standard deviation, I can tell you about pretty much the majority of the population. 67% of the population will happen here. 67% of the time, we're going to see a number of claims between 80 and 100. Awesome. Why do we care about these numbers? Because later on, we can ask the question, was this an unusually high day or an unusually low day for number of claims? If we, under, if we can understand what's a usual day, then we can understand what's an unusual number of claims. Then we can ask what happened. What happened that there are so many age discrimination claims filed on this day? Or vice versa, why was there so few? That's a good thing. But why Was there a new law? Was there a new stricter penalty? And so the number of lawsuits filed went drastically down? These are very good questions if something happened that was unusual and we looked into it. All right, guys. Thank you for watching this video. Stay tuned for more.